back in DTU chemistry lecture by Professor Mario Armstrong. He's a professor and director at the Department of Biophysics and Biochemical Chemistry at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Professor Armstrong, he received his uh, PhD degree in physical chemistry from Bonaires University in Argentina in 1968. And he has since then been at uh, the Hopkins. And uh, for the last 10 years, he has also been the director of the department. And uh, he is an internationally renowned scientist in the field of structural biology with a special focus on X-ray crystallography, structural kinetics, and uh, structural thermodynamics, right? And uh, today he will talk about uh, very important uh, very important copper proteins, and uh, we are very excited to have you here and to hear your presentation. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Hans, for the invitation and the nice presentation, and for the people in chemistry for giving me the opportunity to present the data on uh, our enzyme. Uh, the amidation of bioactive peptides is an important biological process. A large percentage of the neuropeptides and peptide hormones have to be amidated at the carboxy terminus to be active. And uh, in biotechnology, that's a very important reaction because it's very easy to synthesize peptides. It's not very easy to get them amidated at the carboxy terminus. So this enzyme represents one of the ways it can be done and actually does it quite efficiently. So uh, if you study amidation for chemistry in biochemistry, this is not the usual amidation. This is not a transamidation from uh, glutamine. And what it is is peptides are synthesized with an extra glycine at the end. This is the way they translationally synthesize. The sequence of the peptide is here, but they have an extra glycine residue. And the alpha carbon of that glycine is hydroxylated by a first step of this enzyme that uses copper, oxygen, and ascorbate as the uh, reducing equivalence donor. Once it is hydroxylated, this bond becomes very labile, and a zinc enzyme just breaks that bond and produces glyoxylate and the amidated peptide. Uh, so the enzyme is bifunctional, and in some uh, and it has been around for a long time. It goes from uh, a, a starfish to, uh, to humans. And uh, it has two independent activities and two actual independent domains. And in some species, they are separated domains, one that carries out this reaction, one that carries out this reaction. So uh, I'm first going to concentrate on this uh, portion of the reaction, and that's the enzyme that is similar to the core of DBM, the enzyme that was discussed yesterday in Trini's uh, thesis defense. So uh, we are going to look at this enzyme. Uh, and then we are going to look at this other step in the reaction. So uh, in Mammals, is, uh, the enzyme has a quite complicated uh, a genetic arrangement. It has a signal peptide. It has the catalytic core that will bind the coppers. It has some connection here that can be uh, changed uh, during expression. Then it has the catalytic core of the second half. Then it has a connector to uh, plasma membrane a helix, and then it has some cytosolic uh, portion, which is a very small cytosolic portion. The enzyme operates in secretory granules, and this is a low pH organelle, about 5.5. So that has uh, 
important considerations for the activity of the enzyme. So we are going first to talk about the uh, PIM portion. And I mean, we've been working for a long time on this enzyme. And here is just a general list of the structures and activities that we determine. And it includes reduce and oxidize form, many ligands. And I'm going to discuss only a fraction of this. And to make sure that I don't forget to mention other people in the field, major contributors will be Ninian Blackburn, Ed Solomon, Judith Clayman, David Merkler, and then people that work on model systems. There are people that just synthesize small molecules, complexes of copper, that try to mimic this uh, reaction. They use the crystallographic information from enzymes to try to get similar non-proteic groups uh, that will do the same reaction. So uh, the enzyme has two coppers, and it's mostly a beta sheet enzyme. And it was known before the structure was determined that the two coppers were not electronically coupled. So they are two single uh, side uh, copper. And the distance between the coppers in the resting structure is 11 Armstrongs. Uh, one copper is coordinated by two histidines and a methionine, and the other copper is coordinated by three histidines. I will, because of the slides, I'm going to call the copper in this portion either copper B or copper M, M for the methionine, B because it's the second in the sequence, and this one either copper A or copper H, and H for the three histidines. And uh, catalysis occurs close to copper M, and copper A is used as an electron transfer group. So the reduction of oxygen requires two electrons, and copper can only provide, each copper can only provide one electron. So somehow these two coppers will be oxidized and provide one electron each. And we're we'll go going to discuss the mechanism or possible mechanisms for that. Uh, one can look in trying to determine the uh, complexes of enzymes with substrate, you have to somehow stop the reaction. So if you use the oxidized enzyme with both coppers in the copper two form, then you can add substrate because the uh, enzyme cannot act because there is no reductant source of reducing equivalence. And under those conditions, can determine the structure of a short peptide that is a substrate for the, uh, for the uh, protein. And here is the way the uh, peptide uh, binds. This is the glycyl residue. This is a tyrosyl residue that we put two iodines just to be in, have more contrast in the X-ray structures. And then here is the catalytic uh, copper that is coordinated by the two histidines, one methionine, and it has here either a water or a hydroxyl. And here is the other copper, 11 Armstrongs apart, coordinated by the three histidines. There are no ligands uh, bound to that copper, and we are going to discuss that in more detail. We have to slow down. If we want to use reducing equivalence with ascorbate, which is the natural uh, reduce, source of reducing equivalence, then we have somehow to stop the reaction. And to do that, what we did was to use the enzyme that in the position of the hydrogen that has to be abstracted, it has a, a threonine residue. And when you do that, the reaction does not proceed or proceeds extremely slowly. So then under those conditions, we can get the enzyme in the reduced form with a substrate and with oxygen. The reason that reaction is not occurring is because on this substitution, the reaction is so slow that you can soak the crystals, freeze them, and collect the X-ray data. So the important part here is are we seeing actually oxygen? Are we replacing the water in the coordination by oxygen, which is the true uh, molecule, reactant molecule? And crystallographically, what you do is you ask the data what happens if we don't put the, uh, if we don't include the oxygen and the data comes back and tells you you are missing one oxygen, that's the red 
electron density. And then what happens if we put a single oxygen just in case it was water? And the data comes back and tells you you are missing one oxygen. So it's very clear that we were seeing the molecule, uh, the, the protein bound to the oxygen in the reactive form. So here, just to see how it looks in general, this is the catalytic site. That is the peptide. We remove the, uh, just the rest of the molecule. And here is how it bounds. Here is where the hydrogen that is going to be abstracted lies. And here is where the other uh, copper lies with the three histidines. And this is the, st the distance that has to be uh, covered by the electron transfer. And we are going to look at structures that contain that information. So with this information and information from many other groups, uh, sorry, one can propose a mechanism in which uh, if you start with the, uh, for example, here with the oxidized enzyme, the oxidized enzyme, probably the oxygen that we see is a hydroxyl because the charge of this copper is plus two. And then with peptide, we can use ascorbate and reduce the enzyme. And in the reduced form of the enzyme, probably what is bound in the fourth coordination of copper M is water because we lost one charge here, so we gain a proton. And then at that moment, we bind oxygen the oxygen, when it's bound, could be oxygen bound to copper one, or just in resonance with copper two superoxide. And then at some moment, and this is under discussion either here or after hydrogen abstraction, uh, you get an electron transfer, in which case you get now a peroxidate bound to copper two, or superoxide bound to copper one. That's you realize from here to here, there is gain of one electron as it is from here to here, and the electron was lost from this other side. Then a hydrogen abstraction takes place, and this is a radical reaction. You abstract a hydrogen, not a proton, and then you end up with a radical here that then can split the hydroperoxide here to give you the reactants and the products. The product is released and you go back to the cyclone. So we are going to probe parts of this mechanism. And uh, until now, what we were looking was at this species here. And then we are going to try to look at other species and other questions that arise when you look at this molecule. One thing is, what is the electron transfer path? These two, uh, the two coppers, the one here and here, are separated by solvent here. And electron transfer to water just doesn't occur. And if it would be allowed to occur, it's very dangerous because those are hydrated electrons, which are actually uh, ionizing species. So if you look at the structure of the complex with oxygen and substrate, one can see that there is a hydrogen-bonded path between this histidine, a water molecule which is fixed, is visible in the crystallographic structure, and then the carboxylate of the a peptide that is being hydroxylated. Uh, hydrogen-bonded paths are much, much uh, faster than are those through water, and they are just constrained paths. So it's very clear that electrons can come through this way and actually go to the oxygen. So that's the first suggestion that the uh, electron transfer requires the presence of substrate. And that's quite important because if you would be allow a reduced oxygen to be connected to the copper uh, by allowing the electron transfer to occur in the absence of substrate, then the release of uh, reactive oxygen species could happen all the time. By doing this, the enzyme evolved to have a mechanism where you can only reduce oxygen if the substrate is present. So although there may be some leakage of reactive oxygen species, there will not be a major component of the reaction. 
So there is one thing which makes the situation more interesting, and that is that this is looking down at the copper oxygen uh, structure. The oxygen is pointing in this direction. Here is where the hydrogen that's going to be abstracted, and here is where the electrons come in from. So one possibility that we thought was that during the reaction taking place, this oxygen that has certain mobility around that bond will be pointing in this direction, and electron transfer and proton abstraction may be part of the same process. So it will work something like this, that the oxygen from time to time will do that movement, and eventually, and here is where the electrons will come in, so this is where electron transfer and hydrogen abstraction will take place. To make sure that that was not just crazy from an energetic point of view, we collaborated with a group in Argentina, Darío Estrin, and he did quantum mechanical calculations quite elaborate, including uh, QMMM calculations. And they found out that in the uh, X-rays, in the position of the X-ray structure, that's the one. Uh, that's the one here. Oops, I went the wrong way. That's the one here. The most stable structure is not the reactive structure; it's copper two superoxo, and there is a little bit high energy for the copper one superoxo, but. If it is allowed to move, and this is going along this angle, this coordinate is this angle, then the copper uh, one superoxo, the one that we think is part of the reaction, then it becomes more stable. And when you are, let's say, 110 degrees away, which is somewhere here, you are in a very stable structure that actually can transfer, uh, the, it can abstract the hydrogen. So the mechanism has all the possibilities of being uh, just energetically favorable. Now, there is another question that arose many times, and that is, if you look at this side, it has three histidines, and usually when a copper is, has only three side coordination, it has an open liganding site, and it, that site is accessible for binding small molecules, among others, oxygen. We never observed an oxygen there. So uh, we tried to see that what, what is the cause for that site, no binding water, not binding hydroxyl, no binding oxygen, and we look for molecules that have that Solomon and co-workers have determined that bind very strongly to this enzyme, and they are very good copper coordinators. So we, did, we looked at the structure with nitrite and the structure with azide. And uh, here are the structures. This is the structure with nitrite. Nitrite is here. And if you look at this one, this is the electron density. That's where the fourth coordination site will be there is no density. So again, this site does not bind a, a nitrite, which is a strong binder for copper proteins. Here is a little bit more about the coordination, and it coordinates as a bidentent uh, uh, ligand of the copper that is the active site copper. Then we did the structure with azide. Here is the azide. This is turn around just to be able to see everything at the same time. And here is the azide. That's the copper. And then it brings in a sodium to compensate for the charge. But again, this is the other copper site, and there is no coordination. Uh, and then we said, well, maybe we'll coordinate if the enzyme is reduced. So we did the same structures with the reduced structure. So that's by including 5 millimolar ascorbate acid. One important thing uh, for the things we discussed yesterday, we never see ascorbic acid bound to the, to the molecule. 
But on the other hand, this is the reduced form of the enzyme. And in this case, when you put nitrate, somehow the nitrate brings out the copper in this side, but at, you don't see nitrate bound to this copper. It just destabilizes completely the side, and the copper is just released. Otherwise, there are not too many changes in the structure. So, so just what are the, it's very difficult. We couldn't find, even by doing serious calculations, why the uh, other side does not bind. It has a free side, why it doesn't bind? But on the other hand, uh, there are some teleological reasons why the enzyme evolved not to bind small molecules to the other side. And essentially, this is an electron donor side. The only function is to keep a potential above the potential of the reaction such that the electron will be moving downhill. And if you have a four coordination, and that four coordination can be occupied by any kind of uh, small molecules that are within the cell, then uh, the constant redox potential uh, will not take place. It will change depending on what the ligand is. So the enzyme would have been inhibited by small molecules present in the cell. So although we don't know the quantum mechanic reason why it doesn't bind, the teleological reason is very clear. You do not allow the other copper to bind small molecules because you want to keep that potential above the potential of the receiving group. Um, so, uh, a nin the group of Ninja and Blackburn determined that you can run the reaction using hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide has already the oxygen reduced, so he tried it and the reaction worked. He did many experiments related to that, which I don't have time to discuss, but then we said, well, can we uh, f uh, determine the structure of the enzyme in the presence of H2O2. And uh, we did that, and there was the first surprise. It's always a good idea to do the experiments because they are unpredictable, fortunately. And then uh, Kasia Rutska in the lab determined the structure of the complex of the enzyme uh, with hydrogen peroxide. And we found the hydrogen peroxide, the same thing I said before. If you don't put it, the data tells you back you need to put it. But it tells you something else. While the oxygen, when it was bound, was end-on, this hydrogen peroxide now bounds like a side-on complex, which is these two, cop uh, these two oxygens have similar distance to the copper. So just to realize there are many things that could be happening here. We don't know the oxidation state of the copper uh, when we have this structure. We just add a hydrogen peroxide. So again, these are the, this is the geometry. The two oxygens now are at very similar distance, so that's called a side-on complex. We measure an OO distance and then there are two water molecules that come in, and the rest of the coordination is identical to the uh, other structures. So now, trying to see what is this species, if we want to actually propose a mechanism for the hydrogen peroxide uh, used as the re source of oxygen and reducing equivalence at the same time, we have to know what species do we have and then again, the group of Darius String did uh, QMMM calculations. And here are the experimental numbers, copper oxygen one distance, copper two, uh, uh, copper oxygen two distance, the OO distance, the uh, uh, angle between the copper. This is a small angle because it's a uh, side-on complex, so the two angles are close to 70 degrees doing all the calculations that include different species, the double the protonated oxygen 2 bound to copper 
2 is the species that is more similar to the experimental species. So that's what we think we have. So now we can use the same mechanism we had before, but we can now include the species where we bound hydrogen peroxide. So if we bound hydrogen peroxide to copper 2, gets deprotonated and gets the species that we see in X-ray, which is a resonance between these two species. And this species was one that was already part of the mechanism that I showed you. So essentially what hydrogen peroxide does by this shunt here bypasses the need for uh, ascorbate. It uses directly the electrons in hydrogen peroxide. Uh, so this was a collaboration with a Ninian Black Parent group. Uh, and he had used two mutants, these two histidines, there is one mutant and another mutant. These two histidines coordinate the uh, copper H side, the one that does electron transfer only. And he has spectroscopic data on these mutants, and we try to get structural data. And this is very new. We got these structures in the last month or so. We are still thinking about it, but I'll show you the kind of things that you can observe when you just probes things as simply as a, as, a, as a mutant of histidine to alanine. So the first mutant was H108 to A. And one thing that we did and is done many times to use citrate as just adding it there to slow down crystallization. For some reason, it slows down crystallization. In this case, it wasn't that inert, and you will see what happens. And uh, in the first structure that we did, which was the oxidite structure, uh, the, when we saw that mutant, that mutant is of copper H, but then the methionine doesn't bind to the other copper, so there is a large rearrangement, and there is a coordination of the catalytic copper by one of the, by the other histidine, of the other side. And considering that this was something that was not supposed to do this, a, a lot happened. Here we align the C-terminal domains, which are the ones that contain the copper M, the one that is the catalytically active. And here we superimpose that structure with the new structure of the mutant in the presence of, subst a, of a, site, a citrate. And this histidine here used to be back here and coordinating the other copper. The other copper has disappeared, and this histidine now coordinates this copper, and citrate completes the coordination, the methionine moved away. So one thing that we insisted all the time was all the structures that we had had the same distance between the two coppers. We had never seen this thing close down on itself. And this is the first time that gives the idea that actually the two domains could be flexible and there is the possibility that they can close, at, at least in, under these conditions, which are abnormal because this is a mutant, but there, are, there is a closure between the two, uh, the two domains. Uh, for the people that were yesterday in the thesis defense, in the absence of copper or in the presence of small amounts of one of the two coppers, uh, the catalytic core of DBM also comes more or less to this structure, a closed structure. This is the alignment when you align the other domains and then you see that in the uh, purple structure, which is the new structure, the copper has moved much closer to this structure. And these two are similar, but they are just shifted because the structure had closed. And here is more or less how it looks. In the wild type enzyme, this is the coordination of this copper. This is the coordination of this copper. In the mutant, this coordination changes. This thing moves, the methionine moves away, and now you have three histidines, and citrate is there. If this was caused by citrate or just by the 
mutation, we are not sure yet, but in principle it seems to be that this can occur even in the absence of citrate. And here is something that you can see, which is in the wild type, this is the cleft that has to be traversed by the electrons in the electron transfer, and in this one, the whole structure has collapsed and the two domains come close together. Uh, and this is the coordination of the copper. This histidine actually belongs to the other side, but uh, when you mutate uh, histidine 108 and the copper uh, falls out, then this one can coordinate here and the methionine is away. And this is a very nice typical copper uh, tetrahedral coordination. Uh, now here is in detail the superposition. If you superpose the two domains that contain the, this copper, what you see is a small shift in the position of the copper, a moving away of the methionine, and then the appearance of this other histidine here. This was the site with the other copper before the mutation was made. The mutation eliminated that histidine and that one now extends and binds there. Uh, now we did also the structure of the ones, uh, 107, uh, H107 to A mutant. And in this case, again for the first time, we have two molecules in the asymmetric unit and they are both different. Uh, in this one, there is no density for the copper and the uh, citrate is interacting again with copper M and two uh, the histidines of the other copper site. In this other one, the structure is uh, very, very similar to a wild type. So actually they are in an equilibrium that can be captured by two different molecules within the crystal. So this thing here is very similar to the wild type. One glutamate residue moved away. But here, we never saw fourth coordination for this copper. But clearly, when you uh, mutate a histidine 107, you now cannot prevent the copper from becoming tetravalent and having a normal coordination. So clearly there is something in the coordination with these three histidine that prevents here to be occupied. Once one of them is gone, if you get this copper, remains bound, it's bound now with two waters in a close tetrahedral coordination. And in the other molecule, uh, what you get is the normal Copper here disappear, a citrate molecule comes in, and the two histidines now become hydrogen bonded with the uh, citrate. This alanine where the other histidine was, going, uh, was uh, is just up in, uh, against the solvent. And then the coordination of the, this copper uses citrate as the fourth side. So uh, I'm going to summarize it at the end, but this is all what we know. We know a lot about many of the things, how the interpretation of these mutants, we are trying to do the structures now without citrate, but the problem was that the resolution was low because the crystals were very small. And for the moment, if the things we are seeing are related to citrate or are related, related only to the mutation are not very clear. So, I'm going to switch now to the other portion of the enzyme. It's called a lyase because it's not a hydrolysis. This is just a rearrangement of a bond to make glyoxylate and the amidated peptide. So we are looking now at this portion from here to here of the molecule. 
And this is the structure. It contains a calcium ion and a zinc ion. The calcium ion, I'll go very fast over that, is essentially structural. It has no other function or apparent function. And the zinc is catalytic, is uh, the one that involves the polarization of the bond that is going to be broken, like it happens in carbonic anhydrase or in uh, alcohol dehydrogenase. The, uh, the nature of the, there is a uh, bound uh, iron with very low occupancy and uh, the nature of the metals was determined using anomalous scattering in the X-ray data. And the fact that the calcium is mainly uh, structural is very clear from data that was obtained in Betty Iper's laboratory. For example, this is activity left as a function of the temperature. Uh, when you have calcium present, even at 68 degrees, you have reasonable activity left. If you put EDTA, the molecule disassembles much easier in the absence of calcium. And the same is true for a trypsin treatment. It's much more susceptible to a trypsin when you don't have calcium by adding EDTA. The zinc portion of the molecule is the real active site. And in the original structure, we had an acetate that we assume had something to do with the carboxylate of the, the, the way it bound the carboxylate of the uh, peptide. And this is the zinc, and there is an important arginine here and a histidine, which are important for the mechanism. Uh, eventually, there is an is inhibitor of the enzyme called hydroxyhypuric acid, and it has this formula. And you realize it's very similar up to this point to the substrate of this enzyme, which is the hydroxylated glycine. And then it has this group. So we did determine the structure of that group. And then we know then how the carbonyl is aligned and where the hydroxyl is aligned. And one thing that became important is that the only group that could be the one that transferred the proton from substrate to uh, product to the uh, amino leaving group is this tyrosine residue. And the importance of the uh, presence of the arginine residue is that probably in the presence of an arginine, which is strongly positively charged, the tyrosine is deprotonated at least part of the time. So if you put, so here is more or less how the arrangement looks. This is a peptide modeled uh, using the structure of the hydro, uh, hydroxyhypuric acid. And here is the zinc. Here is the tyrosine. And here is the arginine. So this tyrosine is in the presence of a positive charge here, to positive charge, and then the positive charge of the arginine. And what it has to do is to transfer a, a proton from the hydroxyl here to the nitrogen here for the reaction to occur. And just looking at the structure, that can be done in essentially a single step by this tyrosine being unprotonated. So the mechanism of this portion of the enzyme ended up being very reasonable. It's completely pre-organized to carry out that reaction. So just to see how it takes place in three dimensions. That's where the active site is. Here is where the arginine is. And here is where the tyrosine is. So here comes a substrate. This is the hydroxyhypuric acid. And this is what the enzyme has to do. I, I remove the substrate so it can be seen the pre-organization. And it should come back. Here it is. So the Tyrosine has to remove a proton from here. This is highly polarized, and then transfer it to the nitrogen in the living group. And that's the complete idea of that reaction. 
So here is more or less what the mechanism is. The tyrosine is deprotonated, and then what it has to do is to remove this proton from here to make the normal tyrosine, and then leaves here the alkylate that now rearranges, that now uh, this has to capture that proton to give the product and glyoxylate, and then you go back to the initial structure. So it's a very, very simple and reasonable mechanism. So it involves pre-organization of all the required groups. Oops. So there is a function for each of the uh, uh, groups there, zinc positions the substrate and polarizes the bond and use, uh, helps on deprotonating the tyrosine. The tyrosine is the main catalytic group. It works as the base and the donor. Uh, arginine lowers the pK of the tyrosine. And then there are other groups that are also important in the mechanism, but really the mechanism is given by the groups there. Uh, the, you can just try uh, the uh, mechanism by probing different mutants, and the mutants that affect the groups that I mentioned are mostly inactive, and other groups that are further away from the binding site have some influence, but uh, they are not as important as the principal groups. Okay, so now we try very hard to get the full bifunctional enzyme. And trying very hard means a few years, and we never got crystals. So then uh, this enzyme, the, we try many constructs also, but one construct goes more or less from here to here, and with different lengths here, depending on the, uh, on the preparation. And we were unsuccessful, we still are. So then we decided to do small angle x-ray scattering. That's a way it's not, doesn't use crystalline material. It gives you an idea of the envelope of the protein. It gives you an idea of interatomic distances in a very general sense. Usually, it's not enough to provide complete structure, but if you have the structure of the components, sometimes you can do something. Usually, people do different things. In our case, we tend to do cross-linking, chemical cross-linking. And in this case, the chemical cross-linking was tried with these groups, and uh, they are... Uh, succinimides, which are reacting with uh, either lysines or uh, amino terminal groups. And we try things from 12 Armstrong, 16 Armstrong, 22 Armstrongs. And this was done in Betty Iper's laboratory. And the only one that gave cross-linking was the one that was 22 Armstrong. And that gives you part of the answer. The thing seems to be very far apart, the two domains and they don't seem to interact with each other because you cannot get cross-linking unless you have a very, very long chain between them. So these two did not give any cross-linking and only the one that is 22 Armstrong long. And here is the uh, small angle X-ray scattering data. This is the inverse of the resolution uh, multiplied by 2 pi. And here is the intensity. And here are the models that are obtained when you impose the condition that the two lysines that were cross-linked have to be at about 22 Armstrongs. Uh, clearly, here is high-resolution data. We don't have a good high-resolution structure. However, this is the data cut to a lower resolution. And we start to obtain these structures in which this is the connection between the catalytic core and the PAL portion, the one with the zinc. And we took several possible distances here because there are there is about 70, uh, no, 40 amino acids between these two. And 
these are some of the structures which we can obtain that have the distance of 20 to Armstrong between these two. And this one is here. They are quite reproducible and quite compelling. So it's very clear that there is no interaction, real interaction between the two domains of the structure. And at some moment, it wasn't very clear if the enzyme was processive or not. That's transfer the substrate from uh, the product from one as a substrate from the other without releasing it to solution. And that seems to be impossible. One active site is here, one active site is here, and all the models seem to be consistent. Uh, again, this is very new data, but this is our best guess. And this is intermediate resolution now. This is about uh, eight Armstrongs. And this is the agreement with the experimental data, which is quite good. And this is the distance between the two lysines that were cross-linked. And this is the distance uh, be that has to be connected between this one, C terminus, to this one, N terminus. And it's completely reasonable for the number of amino acids. But you realize in all cases, one catalytic site is here, the other one is here. They cannot be a transfer of product in an easy way with the structures the way they are. So that's more or less where we are in the monooxygenase domain. Uh, we have that dioxygen binds N to uh, end on to the copper M in the reduced form. Electron transfer uses the substrate as part of the electron transfer path. And copper H does not bind anything as far as we can tell, not even very strong copper binders. And this lack of reactivity is because you want to maintain redox potential in a narrow range compatible with efficient electron transfer. Uh, in the Elias domain, the one with the zinc, Zinc binds the substrate and polarizes the hydrogen, favoring release of the proton from the hydroxyl. And tyrosine is the catalytic based base, and it is deprotonated because of the presence of this arginine and the zinc. And then it acts also as probably the donor to the nitrogen that needs to be protonated before it can go away. For the uh, overall structure, uh, the domains appear to be very loosely connected. The catalytic sites do not appear to face each other, so it's very unlikely, as some people suggested, that the enzyme is processive. So that's more or less uh, where we are after. 20 or 30 structures and a lot of kinetics and a lot of protein production. But, you know, it's probably one of the enzymes of this uh, kind for which more is known. Now I want to show you. Uh, this is my group. People that worked before in the system are Sean Priggy. He was a graduate student. Now he is a faculty in the School of Public Health of uh, Hopkins. Xavier Sivert, he is back in Belgium. Eduardo Chufan is an investigator in the National Institute of Health. And then uh, these are the people from Argentina. This is Betty Appiah and Richard Mainz, and they are the ones that provide the protein and do many of the uh, enzyme kinetics. Ninian Blackburn is the one that provided the mutants of the uh, histidines. And Chizu Shimokawa was a visitor from Kurume University in Japan in the last year and worked on the last things that I show you. And for some people, I can show you how they look. This is Chizu, this is Kasha, and that's a Eduardo. And this is the rest of my group. Funding came from the National Science Foundation, and most, a lot of the data was collected in the a national synchrotron light source at Brookhaven. This is a photograph or in Argonne National Laboratory. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. 
uh, and of course, I like questions because usually they are, they help me. Do you have any questions? Yes. Um, I don't understand your most of your stories is based on, on static structures from actually crystallography. So you have crystals and you determine structures and so on. As a, as a general question, can one imagine that uh, fluctuation in structure and so on when you have you, you have the, obviously the enzyme that you saw them in, in liquid water? Can one imagine that? that this kind of maybe non-equilibrium fluctuations could play a role for the, for the mechanism. It, it may. And, uh, you know, some of the things that we did it, when uh, QMMM was done, the molecule was allowed to, to go through usual motions because these were focused on very specific steps and more than anything else on the uh, things related to copper coordination or uh, it's not very clear that we will have access to those. But for example, one argument that we used in the past saying, well, probably the coppers don't get close to each other during catalysis because we never observed a structure where the two domains came close to each other. Well, we did a mutation <laughs> and now they are close to each other. Is that part of the mechanism of, or not? We don't know. On the other hand, there is a good path for electron transfer without the things having to move closer. So which one is the one that is mostly operational is very difficult to design, yeah. But we are doing that more and more now, trying to use uh, some sort of a dynamic, uh, usually by computation, it's very difficult enzymes of this size with metals to do it uh, experimentally it can be done, but it's more difficult. Yes. Uh, could it be that your the, the second copper center, which is only three coordinate, could it be that it was reduced during your observation of it in the synchrotron? It was, sorry, it was reduced to copper one. To copper one. Uh, the, in the resting state, the enzyme uh, is, a, is, ox is fully oxidized. So, uh, and that is determined because of a spin. A, the copper one has no spin, goes to an even number of electrons. And a, so, it was determined that it is both coppers are oxidized. It was at some moment a, a suggested by us that it's possible that during X-ray irradiation, because X-ray irradiation produces hydrated electrons, that we may be reducing the, some of the copper. And that's why the structures between the oxidized and the reduce are so similar. And we are doing those experiments in collaboration. I didn't show them here. with uh, exafs in crystals. So we are doing now charge on the copper in crystals that are being irradiated by x-rays just in case. So it is a possibility. We don't think so, but it is a possibility, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What is the, the uh, on average, the, the resolution from this, this uh, crystal brightness? The structures. Uh, if we don't take the last mutants, the ones that we are doing now, the resolutions are you know between 1.9 and 2.4 Armstrongs. So, uh, so you know, we tried to do other experiments, but they are good enough to know, for example, from the oxygen oxygen distance if it looks more like uh, peroxidate or more like oxygen or more like superoxide, yes. But uh, we still want, most of the time, we want to make sure in some other way, yes. Have you considered to do exos on the copper? Uh, 
Ninian Blackburn had excellent exa. I tried to present our data, not his data, but uh, many of these things, not all the results are completely compatible between <laughs> the, two, the two ways of looking at the coppers, but there is excellent EXAFS data. So we are doing a collaboration with the uh, person at Stanford doing EXAFS in the crystals. And those are also providing interesting information. Yeah. Any more questions? Then uh, we say thank you to Professor Armstrong for a very interesting lecture. And uh, let us thank him one more time. Okay, thank you.